morning. Uh, this talk is Introduction to Linux and Open Source. Um, it's hopefully the first one of a series, maybe, of events that we can put on at Barn that I would describe as like, almost like peers teaching peers, uh, because there's a ton of uh, talent, you know, here in the island and especially in Seattle in general. Um, but it's all bottled up in our heads, and. Uh, you know, wouldn't it be neat if there was a, an easy kind of low friction way that um, you know people could come together at a place like Barn and really educate each other? Um, and so that was my my hope, you know, with this uh, particular session. Um, you know, I've uh, been absolutely um, beneficiary of open source software. Um, it's an incredibly powerful tool. Uh, I mean, as I like to put it, you know, this thing here, which I got on eBay for about 200 bucks, um, is the most powerful tool that I have. You know, I mean, even with all our great 3D printers in here and whatnot, um, this one continues to be my most useful, versatile, and powerful tool. Um, and in large part because of Linux and open source and kind of what it allows you to, to do. Um, so, what is Linux? Uh, at the very most basic level, Linux is an operating system. The three major operating systems are, as you're probably aware, Windows, um, OS X uh, on uh, Apple products, and then Linux. Um, and then there are mobile operating systems too. You got Android and iOS, um, which we can talk about later if you'd like. So, most basic level, it's an operating system. It'll make your computer run. Um, it's free. Uh, Linux is um, absolutely, you know, it's free. You can download it and install it on whatever you want. Uh, when I built my computer uh, back in 2010, you know, my, my, my wife insisted we get, we get Windows on it and have an additional hard drive for Windows. And, um, you know, so I actually went to Best Buy, believe it or not, and I bought um, a copy of Windows 7. It was about 200 bucks. Uh, and it was the most expensive component of the computer, uh, which is yeah, it's, it's kind of funny now when you realize that you know Linux just you know you can give this away. Um, that's not to say people don't charge for Linux because they do. You can, anybody can change it and sell it uh, if they want, um, you know, subject to a couple licensing rules. But in general, uh, Linux is free, and I'll get into the details of what I mean by that later. Um, Linux is inherently extraordinarily flexible, so it can run on anything from a uh, laptop to something like this. Um, to this USB stick. Um, this will turn any computer into a Linux machine, uh, fully functional. You, know, you just plug it in and boot it from this and you've got a 100% ephemeral temporary computer. Um, infinitely customizable. Uh, this is one of the things that really appealed to me, because you know, for those people out there who you know spend a lot of time with a lot of time with your computer, you have a really close relationship with your computer. It's just it's it's a tool that you use just all the time, and you probably want to get it set up exactly like you want. And Linux lets you do that. Uh, the most basic level, just by you know configuring anything you want to configure. But then at the more sophisticated level, because it's all open source, if you really want to change something, you can go in the source code and change it. And then finally, uh, the ultimate Swiss Army knife of software, and that's largely because of what's called the distribution system, which is something I'll get into in a few minutes. And that, that's really the core of it, and that's kind of the main point of the, uh, of the lecture. Um, the Linux distribution system bundles um, many, many thousands of pieces of software applications of all sorts, um, you know, and they're ready to go if you want to download them and use them on your computer, usually just a single command. You know, you can grab those, um, those tools and use them. And that's really what makes this uh, a powerful tool. Is that, what, is that what is associated with the word I heard of distro? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, that's a distro. Yeah, people call them distros, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get into the uh, the ins and outs of the distros and talk about a couple of the ones that that you can get. So. Um, the history of Linux, it was originally based off of, you know, back back in the day, in the 70s, um, standard op uh, big mainframe operating system was Unix, uh, sold by, I can't remember who made it, is it Sun who made Unix? AT&T last AT developed it. Yeah. I can't remember, but, um, Unix? yeah, it was, it was Bell Labs. That's, okay, it was Bell Labs. Um, and along came this guy, I'm not exactly sure when, I want to say kind of the mid to late 80s, called, uh, named Linus Torvalds. And um, he couldn't afford Unix, because he had to go out and buy it. Um, and he was a great coder. And so what he did was he essentially duplicated all the functionality of Unix, um, except that he gave it away. And he gave it away for free, and he gave away the source code for free. And the rest is history. Um, 
so on Linux, you really do, it does do everything that you, would, you think nowadays that a computer ought to do. Um, it's not going to have the polish, obviously, of um, you know an Apple product. You know, where Apple controls everything about the entire experience. You know, from the hardware, you know, to the to the graphical user interface, to the software. Um, Linux is much more of a hacker's tool. Um, you know, you can do, you can um, mold it however you like. Um, and it, as I said before, it works on basically anything. Um, you don't need a lot of horsepower to run Linux, um, and by the same token, you can run Linux on a tremendous amount of horsepower. Uh, most of the internet nowadays ultimately runs on Linux. Um, and uh, it scales very, very nicely. And you can make it teensy tiny, uh, such that it would fit on, again, it's a, it fits on this. Um, you know, or you can make it really big. So, what does it mean to say Linux is free? Um, the, in the most kind of basic sense, it means you don't have to pay for it. Um, and again, that's, that's true with a whole lot of distributions out there. Some, some I believe you pay for, but like, like um, OS X, the basis of um, uh, Apple's uh, uh, MacBooks and Apple products, is a customized proprietary version of Linux. Some of that is closed source, and you definitely have to pay for it. Uh, but for the most part, it's totally free. Um, but on a more kind of philosophical, maybe a more noble level, uh, Linux is free to modify, use, distribute uh, as you want, subject to some basic rules. Um, you know that uh, that vary. I mean, you know, the, the most well known is called the GNU Public License, the GPL. Um, and they restrict what you can actually do with it. Usually they say, if you want to modify and you know, redistribute code, even if you want to sell it, you can sell, sell our code, that's fine. Um, you just have to make it open source. And so you have to release your own source code so then other people can benefit from uh, your work. So um, this is the metaphor for a data center. Uh, you know, you, you can have, um, you know, I mean, just uh, a tremendous amount of processing power lined up, um, you know, run very well on Linux. Um, and conversely, uh, people have made it to run on really tiny things. Uh, this device I built to, uh, it automatically turns my computer on when I'm not at home, uh, so I can remote into my home computer. Um, and it doesn't take much power. I just plug it in and I haven't measured it, but it's not a lot. It just is on all the time and it'll turn on my computer when I want it. It's running Linux. Um, so, uh, yeah, as I said, OS X, uh, ultimately based on, um, on a version of Linux, uh, Android, um, the kernel of Android, um, which is really what we talk about, when we, what we mean when we talk about an operating system is Linux based. Um, and then the Apache web server, uh, which you probably use every single day, not realizing that you are using it because it should be invisible to you. Um, is uh, generally Linux based as well. Mm. So, uh, yeah, and again, this, this harks back kind of to uh, one of the points I, I mentioned at the beginning. Um, because there's a huge community of people out there who, who use Linux, usually it is very rare that you, if you want to do something that somebody else hasn't already thought about it and published about it. Um, it's very rare. Uh, and so when you're learning a new tool like, like Linux, your best friend is Google. And so you literally just type into Google, how do I, how do I change the background color on my desktop? And um, chances are the first answer that pops up is actually going to be the one you're looking for. Um, and then uh, if you, you know, are a software developer and if you are, you know, and, and Linux absolutely has a very, I'd say, intimate relationship with software development, then you can go ahead and modify the code on your own and recompile it and uh, make it do whatever you want. So the heart of Linux, and this is unfortunately an eye chart, it doesn't show up on the, on the small screen, but this is a uh, family tree of um, Linux, starting with the original version. And then each little um, branch and then leaf on this tree is a new version that ultimately can trace its lineage back to the original. And that's what we would refer to as a distribution or a distro. And um, a distro is a group of... Um, here, a well, little background first. This, this is the uh, the olden days of software. Um, you know, let's say 
like for the an example I like is that I wanted to print something on our 3D printer here, so I needed to design it in a 3D uh, rendering you know, tool of some sort. So I said, okay, I need a 3D rendering tool. And uh, with one, one single command, you know, issued on my computer, it downloads it and installs it, and I'm up and running. Um, in the olden days, you'd actually have to go out and, you know, identify the one you want. Uh, you know, pr probably wasn't free, might not be free. You probably didn't get the source code along with it. Um, you wouldn't be notified typically of updates. Um, and uh, you always had kind of a, and, and this is one of the classic problems with, uh, with Windows machines, you, you always had a little bit of kind of um, question about whether it would be compatible with your, um, with your machine. And so the beauty of the distribution system is that it largely solves these problems. Um, so a distro really is an organization of people um, that are you know typically you know very passionate about technology um, and you know the potential of technology that um, usually on a volunteer basis uh, maintain this um, uh, collection of uh, open source software such that if you ever need something on your computer like I did the other day you can just you know type in a single command and we can talk about what this command means later if you're interested uh, it'll download it to your computer it'll install it and then it'll keep it automatically updated. And that really, when we talk about Linux, that's really what we're talking about. I mean, that's the magic. You know, and that's what um, enables you to um, uh, do so many things with it. Uh, again, you know, without spending much time, without spending any money. So, there are a number of uh, different distros out there. And I'm just going to step through kind of some of the more popular ones. Um, Debian is what I used, what I currently use. Um, it's a very popular distribution. Um, each one has its own, as I said, it has its own personality. Um, and uh, Debian um, is known as being, and you know, there are pluses and minuses to this, but it's known as being very stable. So the plus is you can, you know, there are people talk talk about these stories about you know Debian machine running for years. You know, it just does its thing, and you never have to to restart it or anything. Never crashes. Um, and the reason it's like that is because Debian, the folks at Debian take a very conservative attitude towards uh, updating their software. Um, and so they will do, wait a long time and do a lot of testing before something gets added in a stable branch. You know, when they say something stable, they really have kind of spent a lot of time, um, you know, uh, kicking the tires. Um, the other characteristic of Debian that's interesting that I kind of like is what I would describe as its philosophical purity. Um, Debian has what they call a, their social contract, um, which uh, really is, I, as, as far as I understand, I don't know really the details of it other than to say that it's a, they, they, they have a commitment to free and open source software. And um, they typically won't include, in the normal Debian distribution, they do not include software that does not meet its criteria of being free and open source, um, either because they don't publish the source, the source code is not available, or because of the licensing restrictions. Um, that's not to say that you cannot, you know, if you use Debian, yeah, you absolutely can get non-free software, no problem. Um, but it's typically not included in the official um, Debian repository. Ubuntu. Um, is I don't know if, which one's the most popular. I mean, this, this may be the most popular distro out there um, for your average user. For somebody who wants to run Linux at home, um, Ubuntu is great for that. It's very user friendly. Um, there's a big community of people out there who use it and can help you. Um, and um, um, it, it tends to be kind of the easiest to get up and running. And one, one point I also forgot to mention about Debian also, that the downside of that stability is they don't update their software very frequently. And so typically if you need, you know, a lot of times if you're trying to write code to do something, it requires a much more recent version of the software than is in the official repository. So, okay, then you have to actually go out and, you know, get that software yourself, you know, or you can move on to one of the, the what Debian describes as their, um, the uh, test testing branch or even the unstable branch, um, w which is kept much more up to date. So that's the, that's the, the, the con, that's the downside of uh, the stability, is it's going to take longer to get the latest and greatest software. Um, so that's Ubuntu. Uh, Gentoo. 
uh, Gentoo Linux is a lot of fun. Um, the, I, I guess what I would describe as kind of the main characteristic of Gentoo Linux is you kind of compile everything. <laughs> You know, and so what you get typically is you actually get the source code from the distribution, and then it compiles on your machine. And uh, a friend of mine, um, for fun, got a uh, uh, you know uh, instance with AWS, which is Amazon Web Services, um, and uh, put you know he, he he basically built his own Gentoo Linux machine, compiling literally every single piece of the software. You know, really squeezing all the optimizations out of it that he could. Um, and so that's. You know, Gentoo is probably, uh, I would say, really kind of um, focused on the uh, the real software geeks out there. Arch Linux. Um, um, I think this is the. Uh, oh, that's Fedora. Sorry, I was going to say uh, Arch Linux is probably less um, less easy to use. I've never used Arch, um, so I put it here in the interest of kind of completeness and. Um, um, but it is known for um, it's known for performance. You know, if you want to optimize your computer to run, you know, very fast, uh, people typically and, and you know what you're doing. Uh, people like Arch, uh, Fedora. Th that's Linus Torvalds, the uh, founder or the father, I should say, of Linux. Um, he uh, he uses Fedora. Fedora is the Linux distribution that is managed by, I believe, Red Hat. Um, which is a big, um, it's probably the biggest commercial, um, I want to say vendor of Linux. Uh, but Fedora, Fedora is completely free. You can get it, no problem. And then, um, you know, I, I would describe this as the enterprise Linux because companies that want to, you know, r run a distribution of Linux and have it be really well supported, um, you know, typically will will use Red Hat uh, and Fedora. Uh, OpenSUSE. Um, that was the f this was the first Linux distribution I used, um, and I don't have really too much to say about it other than um, uh, like Ubuntu, it's it's a good place to start. I'd probably say Ubuntu is probably the better place to start, uh, just because I believe it has a larger user base. Uh, but OpenSUSE is um, easy to use as well. It's been out there for a while. Then um, this is one of the most interesting um, distros of Linux, I think, which is called Kali Linux, um, and this one is. Um, really optimized for, uh, they describe it as uh, you know, offensive security or security testing. Um, because the Linux, is, the distribution, excuse me, the distribution is really focused on tools um, that are effectively tools for hacking. Um, you know, so everything from you know, network sniffers to, um, uh, to uh, tools to break cryptography. And so people who are interested in, in security and cryptography, uh, that's, you know, that's what you would want to start with. Uh, and, and right out of the box, it pretty much provides all those tools for you at, at your fingertips. Um, so um, anything you know, with the processor and a little bit of memory can run Linux, realistically. Um, you know, I like these machines. Again, you get them off of eBay. Uh, companies companies love buying ThinkPads, and so they're constantly, you know, selling them off. And so it's a very active market in ThinkPads, and uh, um, they're just great computers. This one is the X220. I just bought a second one off of eBay, um, and uh, you know, you put a solid state drive in it, and man, it's it really works well. It's very lightweight, and, you know, easy to take carry around, and the battery lasts, lasts a long time. Um, I, the going rate is about two hundred forty dollars. There's there really is a market for it because these things are sold so often, and um, yeah, I would I, I would definitely get a solid state hard drive to make it you know to make it fast, um, and uh, you know you close it down and open it up again. It's pretty much ready to go. Almost like it's almost like a tablet for me, uh, so I always have this with me, um, and. Uh, it's really, you know, uh, super stable. It's just a really nice machine, and so, you know, I would consider this kind of the ideal machine to run Linux off of. Um, the Raspberry Pi um, is really uh, is a lot of fun to run Linux off of as well. If you want to make um, applications, if you have a project that requires a very small and cheap computer, these are about $25. Um, the story behind a Raspberry Pi is really interesting. It started out as a, um, and I think still is, uh, I believe a company in, in the UK um, started making these for educational purposes. And their goal, their mission was to make a $25 computer. And that's exactly what they did. And so when you get this thing in the mail, all that you get is, the, um, is this little circuit board. 
Um, and this is the, uh, the hard drive. Same thing you have in your camera. Um, and so what you do is you put a Linux image onto this. Um, you know, so you, you would use this computer, write the Linux image onto this, plug it in, and then uh, this is a little USB wireless adapter. Um, you, you power it uh, through, through this, and then you can plug in um, a monitor and a keyboard, but usually you're going to access this via SSH, which is um, the uh, remote, uh, it's called, it's, SSH stands for Secure Shell, which is the uh, way that you, the typical way that a Linux user would remote into another machine. It's the much more modern, much more secure version of Telnet. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, if you, you know, the, the really easy way to experiment, experiment with Linux, if you don't want to, you know, buy anything, is just get a little USB and you can put um, an image onto it. This one has the uh, Debian image on, and I'll demonstrate this later. You know, we can take any old computer, plug this thing in, you know, you tell the BIOS you want it to boot off of this, and th it becomes a Linux machine. Um, and again, it's, you know, one of the things that's interesting about this, um, also again from a kind of a security standpoint, is it's 100% totally ephemeral. So nothing is preserved. Um, there's nothing written in on the computer's hard drive. Um, all the action is done in RAM, which is, you know, cleared as soon as the power goes off. Um, and nothing is stored on here. Um, so th this is the sort of thing that people like Edward Snowden really like. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so this is a, a little bit of a summary of um, uh, kind of what, what some of the things we've been talking about. The left-hand column is kind of some of the you know, some of the things that I've used it for. Um, some of the you know f f fun projects that you want to put together. Um, robotics. I uh, I didn't bring it in today, but I used another one of these to build a little robot, um, and I control it. From, there's a little webcam on it that can pan and tilt, and I control it through the internet, and it can roam around the apartment. Um, again, running Linux, running on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, 3D rendering. Um, I made. I needed a housing for something I was built. I was building uh, to print out on our 3D printer, and so I designed the housing in a 3D uh, computer aided design program. Uh, circuit design. Um, I've n done a number of uh, hardware projects uh, using tools from Linux. Uh, machine learning is another large topic that I have a great you know uh, deal of interest in. That is a whole another. Um, series of sessions probably in its own right. Uh, Linux is just great for machine learning. Um, web applications, home automation, and this is my automatic computer turner honor. That's home automation. On uh, amateur radio, um, it's, uh, you know, you can get a um, uh, little, something that looks basically like this. It's called a, a dongle, and it has a little antenna on it, and you turn that into a, you plug it into something like this, and you turn it into a um, software-defined radio. And so it's radio, it's radio trans, it's a radio receiver that can get anywhere from, you know, very low frequencies all the way up to, I, I think about like two and a half gigahertz. Um, and then of course you've got all your normal desktop computer stuff that you would expect. Um, you know, web browser. I mean, you got you know Chrome, um, Firefox. I think I think Safari has a Linux version. I don't think Internet Explorer. No, no. Never mind. Safari doesn't have a Linux version. Uh, most people, I think, most people use Firefox on Linux. Use Firefox or a Chrome. I I, I use Chrome. Um, graphical user interfaces. So you got a couple of, one thing that's interesting here as compared to let's say your MacBook or your Windows machine is you actually have a couple of different types of uh, GUIs to, to choose from. Um, I like one called LXDE which is really lightweight and fast. Um, because I don't like you know the little bar that goes across your screen that takes you know I'd rather not see the bar and have it complete its task faster. And so um, LXD is really you know, optimized for that. Uh, GNOME is the other major, it's probably the major open source Linux um, desktop environment. Uh, very full featured. Um, they, it looks a little, bit like, a little bit like Windows 8, I guess. Um, but yeah, GNOME is, uh, is probably the default for most people if they're just getting started. And then the other big one is KDE. Um, all the other fun stuff then, you know, photo, photo viewing, spreadsheets, presentations. I mean, this is made on Linux, um, et cetera, et cetera. Can you make a cell phone jammer? <sighs> yeah, definitely. Mm. Yeah. Um, 
But uh, I mean, you'd be violating. I mean, that, that would violate FCC regulations, obviously. But you know, yeah, <laughs> yes, it is definitely possible. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. sure. Because I was 